Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks for joining me once again. Back for round two is Tammy Anastasia. We talked about how to pace yourself back in June or July. Can't remember which month that was now already. And today we are talking about triggers. My mom had one that I know of for sure, but thanks for joining us again, Tammy. Thank you for having me again. <laughs> <laughs> it's always fun. I have so many internet friends that I am now starting to, to get to meet. So Tammy's not that far from me. So yeah. sooner or later, we'll, 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 we'll see each other in person and not just on screens. So you've got the book, The Dementia Caregiver. It's on her screen, so I don't have to share it, even though I did grab my copy. It's really a good book. Still working through it. Got other books I have to read for other recordings. It gets, it gets a lot, <laughs> but triggers can generally, um, create a negative situation. I know, like I said, with my mom, she would say, she would speak a sentence of English words that had no context. Mm -hmm. And if you made the, like, if you scrunched up your face, like, huh? Uh huh? Immediate anger. And I was trying to take a picture for my Instagram story to demonstrate that face Holy Toledo. No wonder she got mad because I really looked very, very angry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it was literally just a reaction to trying to, you know, respond in an appropriate, you know, what made sense kind of manner. So like when she would tell me that her brothers were normal people now, instead of questioning, what the heck do you mean by that? Because uh -huh. that's a whole debate for a whole different day. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, I would be like. <laughs> Why is she saying that? And then either you scrunch up your face and then bam, she's mad. Fortunately, that particular day, I was like, oh, that's good to hear. <laughs> right, 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 right. But a lot of times she would just, she would say words mm -hmm. and they, you know, they weren't mumble. They weren't, you know, they were literally, it sounded like a logical sentence, except it was like coming in the middle of a conversation. You have no idea where she was coming from. So, right, right. And people with dementia, you know, as they lose their ability to process information logically for them to, you know, they lose the ability to reason rationally. And I think what happens, it's sort of an automatic default. This is how the brain starts making sense of the world around them because all of a sudden it doesn't make sense. So they become really sensitive to our body language, our tone of voice and our facial expressions. So um, they're going to hang on to you to get a sense as to how, how is the world working around them. So if we show kind of a squint or anger or displeasure, they are like magnets and pick up on it. So we have to be ultra, ultra careful of our body language. And the other thing I, I also recommend that, that people do is start learning their body language, because at some point, as you've experienced, they lose their ability to communicate clearly and express what their needs are. So if we start learning what their body language is now, what they do with their eyebrows, their facial expressions, their posture, we might have a better sense as to what the need is. So when you can't figure out what they're saying verbally, we know their body language and what it's communicating to us. So it's a two-way street, us being more mindful of our body language because they're sensitive to it. And then us start educating ourselves and learning more about their body language. But if you have a relationship with your loved one who gets dementia, we have a history with that person and our buttons got pushed with that person. And then you get dementia. Uh, it's about 99.9% .9 of the time. Those buttons are going to get pushed again, but not for the same reasons they got pushed the first time. Once a person gets dementia, they have really no control over the things they say and do, and, and they lose the ability to censor and filter what they're thinking and what they do. So we want to know what those buttons are, because if we can plan ahead, I always say, let's prepare for the anticipated, right? Prepare for the expected. 
that when they do and say certain things, we already have responses prepared in advance. Did did you know what your triggers were, uh, Jennifer? With my mom or for yeah. me? Yeah, with well, there mom. was the one of the, the the confused facial expression that I've explained on many episodes. The other thing that really set my mother off, and I and I was aware of this, and the only, I don't know, I'll I'll explain this one story. She absolutely got angry as all get out if you offered help. Uh-huh. So obviously, and she needed help. So this was a like lose lose situation. But there was one afternoon. We came back from watching kids in the park or wherever we'd been, and she went to use the bathroom. She was she was doing handling all that fine, but as things happen, her depends got caught on her toe. Wow! Well, and she would she would try to she would cross her legs and try to pull up the undergarments, which baffled the crap out of me because <laughs> I'm like I'm not sure I could do that, and I'm pretty coordinated. So De- and dementia. She's, She's, yeah, it was like, I think it was because it brought her foot closer to her face so she could kind of see things. I mean, I, I could kind of puzzle out a logic sort of, but it was like, mm, okay. And I said, um, let me know if you need help. And then I, and I was only standing in the doorway. Then I left her view, I'm like offer leave because I don't want to get her angry. Yeah. And I mean, I hear muttering and grumbling and swearing. It's just right, right, right. Forgive me. Everything. It was just like, okay. And she must have done that for three or four minutes. It was, it was an excruciatingly long time for me. Cause I'm like, you know, I, I, it, it's only going to take me a second to help her, but I know what's going to happen if I do. So after these three or four, you know, interminable minutes, I peek in and I can see that the undergarment is caught on her toe. Well, heck that happens to all of us. Occasionally we just generally can, wiggle around and get our toe uncaught. Although it's amazing how many times you can get it recaught. Yeah. So I went in and I said, you know, you just got your toe caught. That happens to me all the time. So I literally, I bent over and, and I was bracing myself to either get scratched or smacked. Yeah. And I popped the undergarment off her toe and basically stood up and backed up all the, like one movement was like getting out of her, to her reach. Yeah. And left the room. I'm like, okay, she's free. She can handle the rest of it. And then I forgot I was doing something in her room. She was very good at rolling up about four feet of toilet paper and stuffing it everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Which, trust me, at the beginning of the pandemic, that was really super annoying. Yeah, (laughs) But, you know, I barely, barely helped her. She comes in her room mad as a wet cat saying, I hate my people. And she stomps out of her room in a huff. And I was like, well... Okay, then. So th- I think I was putting clothes away. I was doing some some task, something yeah. logical. And she came back. She must have gone all the way around the the memory care was kind of a like a donut shape. So she must uh-huh. have gone all the way around. She came back in the room. She goes, oh, hi. <laughs> I'm like, uh-huh. okay. <laughs> I'm like, all right. Because I was like literally about 30 seconds away from leaving. Yeah. And then she was happy as a lark again. I'm like, Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Now there's the plus side of dementia, right? They'll forget, but we hang on to it, right? Yeah. Um, And you said something really interesting. And the word help for most people uh, is they they do react. So we try to substitute the word help and uh, try not, we might say support or, um, you know, care. The other thing we do is try to team tag it like, oh my gosh, you know, I hate when my foot gets caught on things like this. You know, you you handled that beautifully in terms of going in and saying, oh, and then when they just start yelling at you and being upset at you, it's just easier to say, thank you for letting me know that. I'll try to do that different next time. I'll try, I'll try to work on that. Because what you need to know is they believe what their mind tells them. They are insistent. And yet we know they need the care. So we have to be very strategic in how we do that. And a lot of it is learning what their triggers are, what their words are that trigger them. Help is one and no, they hate the word no. So there, what we do is couch things in a way that focus on the things they can still do. So instead of having to say no, we focus on, oh, you know what would be great mom or dad or whoever 
is if you if you did this, then we don't have to say no to that that they can't do, but we focus on again redirecting them in terms of what they can do. And the same thing with help. How can we work around not use the word help, but work around that phrase? So good for you for for knowing what her triggers were. And now let me ask you, what were your triggers? Hmm. Let me think. So you mean the stuff that like she would do that would upset me? Yes. That that w- you would react to. Would she say, would there be a, a tone of voice? Um, you know, if you were in a rush, you know, you don't ever want to rush somebody with dementia because <laughs> nope. it's going to backfire. Right. Yeah. Uh, were there certain things that pushed your buttons? Well, she was when I was growing up in even as an adult, she would always accuse me of, oh, you're being so negative, which it must just be my default or that's how, you know, like, I think I'm making a statement like, well, I think it should be like this, period. It's a statement. It's not a negative. It's not starting an argument with you. It's just a statement. I think this, period. You may disagree. That's fine. I'm not yeah. saying no. Just telling you how I think. <laughs> <sighs> even that even my husband pulls the whole, you know, you know, why do you say it like that? Like what? I just told you what my thought was. You know, it's just yes. weird. I don't know. It just, it's been a thing my whole life. But when she, you know, in the later stages, she, oh my God, it was like the table was flipped. She would say things and it'd be like literally mentally just like chomping down on my tongue. Cause I'm like, you so want to say the things she used to say to me, yep. but I'm not going to because- yep. That will just make a really horrible, nasty situation. <laughs> yep, 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 exactly. So and that was hard because it was like, you know, man, if I had said that to you, you'd have been like, <laughs> rah, 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 rah. Oh. I know, I know. You know, navigating this disease is tough because we have we have the caregiver and your feelings and emotions and needs are just as important as the person you're taking care of. The difference is the person you're taking care of now has this brain disease and an altered version of reality that's going to be very different than our version of reality. And not only that, we we lose bits and pieces of them the way they were before, but we can still embrace and find new ways of communicating with them. But it's a big transition that we have to make, right? So one of the best things to do is, uh, especially to conserve your energy, is to uh, document or write down when you react or when they react, what was the situation that occurred? Because for as unpredictable as dementia is, there are times where we might see what we call triggers, patterns, or causes, right? And if we can identify what those things are, we can preemptively either prevent them from happening and or lessen the degree of intensity or frequency in which they happen. So it's always good to know what what your triggers are and what their triggers are. So I I was doing a talk one one day and uh, this gentleman, actually, I get this question a lot. How do I deal with my mom or my dad, whoever they're taking care of, who is manipulative? And uh, and then I have to say, pre-dementia? You have to have a lot of thought in how you're going to manipulate. When a person has dementia, we just default to this is now dementia. Because if you keep thinking they're doing this intentionally, that is constantly going to create this angst and this anger and this frustration. And we have to conserve your energy. It's not to say you're not going to get mad or get angry, but we just want to lessen the frequency in which that occurs for you. And if you do get angry, just look at what pushed my buttons. What can I learn from this so that I can prepare better next time? So if we default to dementia is causing my loved one to do these things, it becomes about dementia and not them and not you, meaning you're not the cause, they're not the cause, dementia is causing them to behave this way. So it's a nice mantra because it's very difficult to detach, but if we can detach, how we react is going to be different than if we personalize it. So if I make it about dementia, it helps me prepare responses that are less reactive and more reflective. Does that make sense? Oh, totally. 
I'm re- reminding myself of that when she was going on and on and I, when, you know, in the situations where it's like, now if I had said that to you, when I, <laughs> as you know, before Alzheimer's, you know, you would have been like, rah, rah, rah. if I, that was hard because, well, it kind of reminded me that I had the option to be kind and loving and not, not spew back the not negative she spewed at me, but it was, it was exhausting. Cause it was, you know, you just, there was times when one of her favorite statements probably forever was you'd bitch if you were hit with a new ax. Well, yeah, I probably would. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And you know, there was times I wanted to say that to her so bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. The other, there was one other trigger that happened very close to the end of her life. We went to lunch and I should have known, you think I've learned so much, but it's so hard it is. when you're taking care of a parent because you're trying to be respectful and you're trying to do all these good yes. things and they're pushing every single one of your freaking yes. buttons. Yes. <laughs> but she had, the week before we'd had a beautiful Christmas lunch, just the two of us in the assisted living dining room. The food was great. We basically had little cheeseburger sliders. So they were like tiny little hamburgers that were perfect. They were bigger than a slider, but they were pretty small. And she struggled because, you know, sometimes the cheese makes the pieces slide apart. So when we went a week later, now she had fallen the day before she had stitches. So she probably, I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure how much low, much more low key we could have done, but we went and she got the beef tips with the noodles and I swear she pushed more food <laughs> off the back of her yeah. plate and then she'd fuss and grumble and grunt and and scoop everything up. She had what I called Alzheimer's OCD. Uh-huh. She would fuss over the three crumbs on the table. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, your food's getting cold. You know, do, and I, I kept asking her, I don't know, I must have asked the questions too many times, but I, I was trying to encourage without you know basically saying could you please eat your flipping lunch yes 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 and she got so angry with me she literally had a nap she turned her head and had the napkin up like this so she couldn't see me because she was so upset oh she was so upset with me that somebody else had to put her in my car wow and i cried all the way home i was so stressed out and so i'm so stressed so exhausted so frustrated so angry it was just like the rest of the world could blow up and I didn't care. I was just, it was really, really, it was one of the worst days that I'd had with her. And I think because it was the exact opposite of the week before, right. and we did the exact same thing. Right. Because I'd finally learned from all my wonderful guests to, you know, shorten the visits. Yes. Because, you know, I was trying to give her as much joy and quality of life and time with me and blah, blah, blah. Yes. I forgot that it was exhausting for her. So once yes. I finally got through that, through my thick head, yes, we went. So to our Christmas lunch, we had, we had the lunch. I brought her one gift. We were literally, it was literally one hour from when I picked her up the memory care, put her in my car, drove her around the building. We had lunch in the assisted living dining room, back in my car, back around the building, back to the memory care, like yeah. literally 65 minutes. And she had a great time. I had a great time. Yeah. I was not exhausted. I was not drained. And then the next week, I'm like, that worked great. Let's do that again. <laughs> Total <Yeah>. failure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's it, right? You're in the here and now with them. You're in their here and now. And I think that's one of the frustrations with this disease, right? Why did why was that so successful that time? And now this time it's it's just it's it's a bust, right? And I think here again, reading their body language and seeing, oh, you know, there's that look in the face or, or, or that tone of voice or the way they said something. It's like, you know what? We'll cut this short, right? Because you're right. They do better uh, as this disease progresses. They do much better with shorter frequencies of time. And, you know, we get used to, we think quantity, it's all about the quality. You know, you could walk in, I love you, I miss you, give a kiss. That that could mean more than anything in two, three minutes than trying to stretch out a visit that ends ick after an hour, right? So again, it's just it's just being more mindful and learning them. The other thing we have to factor into, especially in my work, uh, I need to have a comprehensive family history. 
I will take them all the way back and try to get as much information as a child as possible because, as you know, that disease, right, long-term memory stays intact a little more, longer than short-term. So what starts happening, they confuse the present with the past and knowing their personal history. So let's tell them, remember you and I talked about your mom always walking behind you? So yep. share that story. Remember oh, yes. we talked well, so, about and you couldn't uh-huh. figure it out? So I would take my mom to the park generally, and she always walked at least 15 feet behind me. Mm, yeah, 12 to 15 feet easily. Yes. And if I slowed down, she would slow down. If I stopped, she would stop. Yes. She would not walk elbow and elbow. She would not hold my hand. I mean, the one day that I finally like coerced her into walking elbow and elbow, she finally got super irritated with me. This is also close to the end of her life. She literally told me, you know, she wrenched her elbow out from mine and some, you know, I told you to drop dead. Yeah. <laughs> Which was not to and that was kind of pre pre Alzheimer's mom too. She was she could she could lash out. But when you and I were talking before our first recording, you gathered from me that my mom was the oldest of four siblings and she was obviously in charge when my grandparents were working and doing other things. It's just how, you know, I'm the oldest of two. So I'm completely aware of that responsibility. And she probably walked behind her siblings so she could keep an eye on them, which trust me with her brothers that she claimed were normal people now. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Not such an easy thing to do. And her sister's like 11 years younger. So that's, you know, if she was, 15, that made her sister, what, four? I can't do math. It's Monday. (laughs) I mean, she was young. So she, you know, she was keeping an eye on the kids and that's probably what she was doing with me. And had I known that, you know, several years ago, I would have just walked backwards and hopefully not landed on my own head and play acted um, so that it was more of a familiar situation because I was so worried because because her visual processing was so poor, yes. she would try to step around. Like if the sidewalk had streaks of wet, you know, from the sprinklers or whatever, she would try to step around those, which I understood why. Yes. It was one day she tried really hard not to walk on her own shadow, which was hysterical and frustrating and sad all at the same time. Yes. So I was just, I'm like, I just knew like this woman is going to fall on her face yes. on the concrete and yes. I am going to be the complete SOB because I was, I wouldn't slow down for her. It's just yeah. like, it's going to be a 10 times worse because she won't walk next to me. I mean, I understood why, like if you walk next to them, they can't necessarily see you because they don't have great peripheral vision, which I totally get because I have the same problem. So, I mean, I can totally like, I live that experience, but oh, yeah, it was so frustrating. But learning from you, it's like, oh, you know, she's probably keeping an eye on the kids. It's like, exactly. Oh, Lord, <laughs> why exactly. did I not know that before? <laughs> so, so now that you knew that, what would you have done a little differently that would still make you feel safer walking with her? But what would you have done differently having put that connection together? Well, she would also watch her feet. Yes, um, which is really bad. There was t- sometimes. She walked looking at her feet so badly that was, and I, you know, stupidly, because I didn't know what else to do in in the moment. She was watching her feet so hard. I'm like, you know, where you're looking is where you're going to end up, like on your face, which I knew at the mo at that moment. I'm like, that makes no sense to her whatsoever, because it's not, not the clearest of statements, period. But knowing what I know from you now, I probably would have walked turned around and I would have said, oh, I would have turned around and said, oh, wow, look at that really cool bird up there. Because I was always pointing out things in the sky to make her look up. I'd point out clouds and birds and airplanes and, you know, rockets and, you know, aliens flying by, whatever I could come up with to get her to stop watching her feet so that she wouldn't face plant on the sidewalk and make me look like a completely horrible person. And I probably would have been more playful. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. If, if I, if I was, I would basically play act as one of, not as one of the siblings, but kind of play act that kind of scenario. Like, oh, she's keeping an eye on me. Right. So I can be goofier and, you know, pretend I'm one of the kids and 
turn around and keep an eye on her. Right, right. And, and hope- probably <laughs> she just wanted to make sure you were in front of her. So I would have probably reduced how far I walked in front and probably would have been closer to her where I felt at least I was in more arm's reach. And I probably might have been, I would have been in the peripheral vision. But see, again, knowing this personal history really helps us understand and know how to work around some of these behaviors that just seem odd and are incredibly frustrating. And I do want to go on record that this disease causes you to get frustrated. This disease causes you to get angry. I don't want anybody to feel bad because you get frustrated or angry. We're just trying to figure out how to manage it better so you cope better with it. And it lessens the degree of stress and burnout that this disease can have on you. And so getting that personal history. And here's a here's another example. So I got a call, an SOS call. I call it a crisis call. And uh, the, the, the mother was packing two suitcases and she was just beside herself. She lived in a care community. The daughter is just sobbing on the phone. I don't know what to do. So, you know, you listen and, you know, with my background in counseling, I kind of listen for certain things and it's the way it's said. So I said, you know, it sounds like your mom is leaving a situation that was uh, abusive. And she's like, what are you talking about? I said, it just sounds like she's packing these suitcases to get whatever's going on to get get out someplace safe. Fast forward 24 hours later, the daughter calls me to say that she was an infant. And when she was born, her father used to hit the mother and the older sister. And the mom would pack two suitcases and take the kids down to the neighbor's. And when the daughter put two and two together, we knew how now to interact with mom because we knew what the need was. We knew what was going on in mom's head. Now, do we know absolutely for certain? No, but there is a lot of personal history that is so informative for us to help us figure out how to take care of their needs because every behavior is an expression of a need. Every Mm -hmm. behavior, repeating questions, lashing out, getting angry, frustrated. I I hate the word help. Okay, this is all information for us to absorb and figure out, okay, how do we work around it? Because they're communicating something to us. And when they have dementia, keep in mind, they don't have control over the things they say and do. And our initial reaction is you're doing this intentionally to annoy the crap out of me, right? (laughs) And um, don't you see, I'm working my butt off to take care of you and you're unappreciative. And it's not because they're unappreciative. Again, we have a diseased brain and their brain is malfunctioning. So how do we make this journey and survive and yet still be able to maintain a relationship with our loved one who is changing because of dementia? Do you find in your in your work that it's these kind of relationships are a bigger struggle for the child of a person living with dementia take to take care of than a spouse. Because I think that, I think that's 10 times harder because, you know, you're trying to be respectful. I know a lot of, you know, children taking care of, which is, we're all adults, but the, you know, the offspring of the person living with this disease, you know, they don't like the therapeutic fibbing, Yes. Because, you know, God forbid you lie to your mother. You yes, know? <laughs> yes, yes. Fortunately, I learned, I learned like secondhand why you, why you do that. My aunt had to tell my mother, my grandmother, excuse me, my grandmother burst into tears one day and said my grandfather had left her for another woman, which of course I'm sure caught my aunt a hundred percent off guard because my grandfather was gone yes. and he did not leave my grandmother for another woman. Yes. Unless you, you're thinking of a celestial other person, but that's not what my grandmother was saying. And she's like, no mom, dad died. And then they had to go through the whole grieving process, yes. which I think was so thankfully, you know, most of the time we don't really learn from other people's experiences, but I learned from that one. So I yes. knew like I yes. never reminded my mom that her husband was gone. She thought I was her best friend, so that was that was confusing. It also kept it made it easy for her to keep me a little bit at arm's length, which was mm-hmm. sort of frustrating because people say, "Oh, you know, 
massage moisturizer into their hands. Yeah, my mom hated that. Yes, yes. Because <laughs> I don't think I'd want my friend to do that on me unless, I don't know, not and, in most situations, I would not want my friend to do that for me. <laughs> and here again, everybody's individual, right? Mm -hmm. And And you have to keep in mind, this is where, again, knowing their history, someone who had uh, abuse issues, if we're going to go and rub their back or touch them, we better kind of know a little bit about their history because some abused people will feel you're violating them and you're attacking them. So, and again, if we have dementia and they don't understand what you're doing, as you know, you know, with bathing and things like that, you know, the defense mechanism kicks in. Defense mechanism kicks in when we feel threatened. It's not that you're doing something wrong. It's that their brain cannot understand and process what you're doing. Again, go back to that dementia mantra. Dementia is causing my loved one to react this way. And um, know when they lash out, it's a defense mechanism protecting them from something that doesn't feel right. You're not doing what's wrong. It's their brain can't comprehend and understand what's happening. Let's go back to your question. It's an excellent question. It's the dynamics. The dynamics between a child and a parent is very different than between spouses. And so is it easier or it's just different? The dynamics are different. You have a history with a spouse that's different than the history with a child. And with a child, we call you the sandwich generation. With a child, when you're raising your own kids at the same time, but when you're a child taking care of a parent, your role now changes. And, um, and so that role changes. That dynamic alone is very different than the spouse taking care of a spouse. And so, yes, they're very different. Dynamically, it can create different issues. There could be more unique issues with that dynamic being a child taking care of a parent than a spouse taking care of a spouse. No matter how you look at it, though, relationships are relationships. So That's depending true. on that relationship you have with the loved one pre-dementia is going to also carry over into how this relationship is going to be as, as, um, as a caregiver taking care of a loved one with dementia. So let me backtrack. I have adult children that come and see me who are now taking care of a parent who physically, sexually molested them as a kid. Yikes. And now they're taking care of this parent with dementia. I have spouses who are taking care of a spouse who had an affair. So you can see there's so many dynamics that play out. And when you learn that personal history, and I always ask, what's the dynamic? What was your relationship like pre-dementia, right? So there's a lot of factors we have to consider when we're taking care or we're in this new role. This is a new role for everybody. So I would just say that it's different dynamics. Okay. Some carry over, but it all comes down to what was that relationship like pre-dementia? And some could have a horrible, horrible relationship with their loved one pre-dementia. Now they take care of their loved one and there's some healing that goes on in this relationship. So it really varies from person to person. But um, knowing your triggers and knowing that personal history are critically important in terms of how we cope and survive on this journey. And I credit you, you, you know what was going on. And we learn by doing. There's no perfect answer. There's no perfect strategy. There's no perfect outcome, right? All we know is we're doing the best that we can on any given day. And some days are better than others. And I think one of the things that I really want to instill in people, a bad day doesn't make you a bad person. A bad day is I had a bad day. It was tough. It was challenging. But most caregivers walk away feeling this enormous guilt and then feel bad about themselves. Every caregiver in my book is a gift, is a blessing to the person they're taking care of. And we have to appreciate who we are and what we're doing even when we do make mistakes. So mistakes are opportunities to learn from. And like you said, this therapeutic fibbing, which I like to consider therapeutic acts of kindness. I kind of rework it, right? Because I'm providing you information to try to prevent distress, to, mm -hmm. to, to try to prevent this 
a horrible reaction and now you can't process this information. So I'm sharing you information to, again, minimize the emotional distress or angst that you might go through. And so I like to think of it as therapeutic acts of kindness. Yeah, that's a good term because she would ask me, it it lessened as she progressed. Mm -hmm. But for the first year and a half, remember, she lived three years past my dad. Yes. We'd, we'd go to the park or wherever, didn't matter where we were going. And she'd say, does my husband know where we're going? And it was always that tone of voice. Yeah. And it <laughs> took me, it took me a while to realize there was one day she literally asked me that like six times between her room and the parking lot. Yes. And trust me, it wasn't that far. Yes. By the time we got to the car, I was like reassessing my decision to take her anywhere yes. or maybe I should just shove her in the trunk yes. or you know, it was just like, yes. you know, it was just like, ugh. and I, I literally put my hand on the car door. I put her in the car, walked around, put my hand on the car door and went, duh, she's asking me that question because I have not given her an answer. When she would say, does my husband know where we're going? I'd always say, yes, mom, dad knows where we're going. Apparently that was two different conversations. It is two yes. different conversations, but it took me way too long to figure that one out. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Yes, but you bring up an excellent point. Repetitive questions, when they repeat, when they repeat is an expression of a need. She needed to know that you heard that it's, she is concerned that her husband knows where you're going. And so we get so frustrated with the repetitive questions, but there's often themes. And so when we listen to the repeated questions, what they're saying over and over, try to figure out what the need is, get past what they're asking. Like a lot of times, as you know, they'll ask, I want to go home. Home is a metaphor for wanting to feel safe, wanting to feel secure. They're in a home they've lived in for 40 years, but the home their brain is thinking of could look very different inside than the home they're living in now. So home is metaphor for feeling safe. Um, does my husband know that we're leaving? She doesn't want to do something wrong. She wants to make sure he's informed. In other words, listen to the themes. Most themes are they're telling you something they want that's memorable. They're telling you something that's super important or they're telling you something they're afraid of or they're concerned about. And sometimes they just want to be the center of attention, right? <laughs> so know that repetitive questions are, again, an expression of a need. And she said it six times. So clearly there's a response that I need to say. And she may ask again, and you just say the same response or tweak it a little differently because at some point it will subside. Now, will she remember an hour from now, half hour from now? We don't know. But yes. Look at these repetitive questions as what are they trying to communicate? What is the need? And then we try to respond. And if, if we're wrong, they'll let us know and we'll try a different response. Trial and error, trial and error, and trial and error. Well, that particular day when I finally, it dawned on me that I needed to tell her that, yes, he knows where we're going. Uh -huh. And he told us to get the heck to, you know, basically get lost. Uh -huh. I don't remember the exact terminology, but it was... It was somewhat in the tone of what she was expecting. She didn't ask me the rest of the day. 
See? Yeah. And so when they feel heard and understood now, it's a fluke. We could do brilliant, answer it, respond to it beautifully. An hour from now, she may not remember. So we'll try either the same response or we just tweak it slightly. But that's the thing, right? Their brain is just going to react because, again, it's, um, it's, it's not functioning properly. So we have to adjust how we interact with it and try to understand as much as possible. But if we can detach and not take it personally, which is much easier said than done. Oh, yeah. <laughs> then um, then we'll, we'll again, we'll, we'll provide responses that are more reflective than reactive. And we're going to react. I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to react. You're going to get impatient. Again, frustrated and angry. Just accept that's part of the journey. Forgive yourself. And what can I learn and do differently next time? So having been through this journey yourself, um, what do you wish you would have known then that now that you've learned that you wish you would have known fast forward five years later? Hmm. There's a lot, but I was thinking about one of my triggers was trying to deal with her and also the medical profession. That is not, I needed to bring somebody along with me on yeah. those um, excursions because, you know, I always had to remind them that, yes, my mother has advanced Alzheimer's. No, we're not going to do it that way. Yes. Don't yes. you remember that we did it this way last? Like, why do I have to remind you people? She's the one with Alzheimer's. Yes. And then of course I was irritated and then she, you know, just, it never went well. <laughs> so should have brought somebody with me, which just added to the, you know, difficulty of managing those appointments. But, you know, you always hear, well, you have to be in their reality. Well, I tried that and I didn't realize early on that their reality might not, might have been a different decade or, you know, that's like right. she thought I was her best friend, which, that's right. you know, that's not a big, you know, that never bothered me. And it was kind of funny because she'd tell people, I've known her forever. And I'm like, yeah, my whole life, maybe. You yes. Know? yes. Then I would say that and the caregivers would laugh. And, you know, it was just, it was never a negative kind of feeling. But, you know, when she would talk about her brothers, but not her sister, and it yeah. always kind of bothered me because I'm like, you for, you're like, one brother hasn't, I mean, he hasn't even contacted me. I don't even know when the last time. He didn't even contact me after his sister died. Yes. So, you know, the younger brother and the sister would go and visit her. So it was really strange to me that she didn't ever talk about her sister. And when I would ask, she would say, I don't have a sister, which always kind of struck me as like, well, that was more painful than her thinking I was her best friend. Like that never bothered me. Yeah. But I didn't really understand until much later that that was her reality. Like her reality included the two boys, not her sister. That's right. Was right. Really, you know, maybe that's because she had two kids of her own. I don't know. It was just that one was really hard to to contemplate. But just I really we had a good relationship, but it was also challenging. So sure. that's sure. how our caregiving or my caregiving for her went. You know, like I would give her as little help as possible to get her over the hump. Yes. Like with the, the undergarment stuck on her toe. Yes. And you know, maybe she got angry because my body language was like, please don't hit me while I'm like kneeling on the floor, right at a good level to get smacked. So, you know, that and, and we I really wish I had known that shorter, more frequent visits would have been better for both of us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But we learn by doing right again, you know, we're doing the best that we can with the knowledge we have. And, and, and don't forget, we have needs too. Right. And, um, and again, we don't know I, I, if I was going to go fishing for this relationship with your sister, we'd probably find an answer why your sister, uh, her sister was not mentioned, right. Dynamically, the family dynamics, you know, were a certain way. And if we were going to go fishing, I would go fishing about, tell me more about the relationships with the brother. But what we do know is whatever she's presenting is, it is her here and now, right? And what do we do with that information? How do we embrace that information? How do we comfort them? How do we reassure them? How do we make them feel safe and keep you out of harm's way if possible from getting a, a slap, right? But again, it's that they will always, always react when they, again, often don't understand or are frustrated themselves, right? 
And one of the big issues that I write about also in my book is this resentment that uh, comes up in, in taking care of somebody with dementia. So again, um, their reality has now shifted dramatically and you have one foot in this reality and one foot in and trying to manage this new reality with this relationship that you've had 30, 40 years that now with dementia has changed. And now I have to learn to acclimate and develop a new or a different relationship with this person that has been my parent or has been my loved one, right? So it's a very, very challenging disease. And how do we just help you guys get through it better? That's what what it's about. How do we help caregivers get through this better? You started this podcast because you wanted to offer help and suggestions to make this better for everybody, correct? Oh, yeah. And I'm the one that bet. I don't know. Well, I think I've benefited the most. <laughs> I think everybody benefits, right? No one has a perfect answer, but we're all out here trying to make this journey the best that it can be to make it as compassionate, loving, and supportive. And because, again, if you do lose your patience, you're still that compassionate, loving person. And you may walk away and not like how you feel rather than beat yourself up. Just ask yourself, what can I do differently next time? You know, it's Mm -hmm. just constantly educating ourselves, but also we need a breather too. We need to count to five. We need to take a break. Sometimes, you know, I'll get calls from family caregivers to say, Tammy, I just can't go see my loved one for a week. And I said, don't go. Because if you need that break, if you need to take care of yourself, We need to take care of you because we forget you are just as important as the person you're taking care of. So in my opinion, you did a beautiful job taking care of your mom. You read her very, very well. It was challenging, but you got through it. And in the end, no matter what, I truly believe in the end, their heart knows who took care of them. I hope so. They know who took care of them. I had an interesting incident probably about six weeks before she passed away. We, I can't remember if this is the same day that we were walking. I had gotten in the habit of keeping nail clippers in my purse because Uh the staff's not allowed to trim nails because if you cut the skin, they get an infection, bad stuff. Right. Understood, you know, irritating, but whatever, you know, got it. And her nails were getting really long and she had gotten in the habit of when she was frustrated or angry with somebody, she would literally claw people. She'd actually drawn blood on a caregiver several times, wow. which was wow. very frustrating and embarrassing because they put up with it. Because obviously they can't really fight back because yep. it's elder abuse. Well, <clears throat> I went to trim her nails because they were um, long and I'm like, oh man, <laughs> these are weapons. And... I forgot how I broached the subject. I think it might have been the same day that she told me to drop dead because we'd been walking. So it was probably (laughs) really bad timing on my part. (laughs) Yeah, it was, you know, (laughs) stupid, stupid timing on my part. Uh Uh-huh. Um, but she she grabbed my wrist and she was trying to claw me. Yeah. And so I just I just grabbed her hands and I said, Oh no, we're not gonna do that to me. We're not doing that today. And oh my goodness, if looks could kill, I would not be here today. Yes. <laughs> because yes. she was really, really not happy with me. Yes. I did not get the nails trimmed. Yes. But it it literally was getting into like almost a physical battle. That's right. And I was so, it was like, okay, I'm at about a nine. And when we hit 10, it's going to explode. So yeah. I literally said, well, nope, we're not doing that. I stood her up. I propelled her into the assisted living, which had normal entry door. And then they had the key code door. I yeah. punched in the code, opened the door and said, bye, shove yeah. her in, close the door. Yeah. And the next week the staff was like, man, you were to not happy with your mother. And I explained to them what happened. They're like, oh, that makes sense. But they were laughing because yeah. they were like, oh man, she's not happy with her mother today. Yeah. And I think it was funny to them because it was very unusual, but I was like, oh no, no, no. We are not clawing me and drawing blood and act. Nope. If that's how we're going to act, the visit is over. Boop. Yeah. And you do have to protect yourself. Right. But, you know, just based on what you're describing with your mom, your mom has some history of, of not being treated well, probably in her past on some level. Right. And this is how she lashed out. This is how she took care of herself. And or sometimes they repeat what was done to them. 
so, you know, we have this history, the more I listen to your mom and how she behaved. And again, sometimes the sweetest, the kindest person can become very aggressive because of dementia, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying every person, but that personal history is super critical and important information. And if I spent time with you, I would go fishing for that information. You would say yay or nay, but I'd still go fishing for that information. So I want to go back to something you said too. Now you've been through the medical with your mom. Mm. What would you <laughs> suggest people do differently? Because the medical community um, still needs to be educated more about people with dementia. So a lot of caregivers are going with their loved ones to the doctors. What would you recommend having been through it yourself, you would do differently? I know you said you'd bring uh, one more person. What else might you do differently? It's more of what I wish they would do. Okay. Um, her general physician's office was very good at not making us wait very long, which was good because her patience for waiting was, yes, you know, pathetic. Yeah. And she couldn't track with TV shows or read magazines. So, you know, yeah. keeping her entertained for 10 minutes while we waited for the doctor was a nightmare. Yeah. Her neurologist was always behind schedule because she spent the amount of time that she felt necessary with the patients. So yeah. after the first visit that where we waited an hour. Yes. And I sicked my mom on the receptionist a couple times <laughs> because yes. I was like, this is getting ridiculous. I finally learned to go check in, ask how it, like, how far behind is the doctor? Yes. We're going to go across the parking lot and get something to drink. Good. Text me when I need to, like, give me 10 minute warning, but text me. Great. That worked out great. You yes. know, never had any issues. But the general physician staff always acted like everything was my responsibility. You yeah. know, I'm supposed to be able to go collect urine. Yeah. And the, I'm like, we tried that once. Yes. So why they didn't have, you know, why they didn't have notations. Like there was one day I was so frustrated with the, basically the office manager person. I'm like, why is this not like in a bold red label on the front of her chart or the yeah. inside front of her chart? Because yes. I'm tired of having to tell you all this stuff. Yes. And my yeah. frustration leaks over to her. Um, they needed to understand that we were, she was the patient, but there were two people that they needed to deal with to get the information they needed. Right. And that did not happen with the general physician. The neurologist, I don't, she was great. She yeah. would look at my mother, but listen to me. So like, yeah. you know how when a cat turns their ear one way, yeah. that was the neurologist. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah. she was, she was great, but I mean, there was never anything she could do to help make anything better, obviously, but she did tell me one day, I must have looked frazzled and exhausted. She goes, you're, you know, you're doing a really good job. And of course, my first reaction was like, how the hell would you know? Which is a completely <laughs> right. typical reaction that my entire family would have. Yes. Um, but when I thought about it, you know, kind of like took a step back. I was like, man, I really appreciate she said that. So right. they just need to understand that sometimes, you know, you cannot cure them, you cannot fix them. So let's address what's going on right now. But yes. please understand that the caregiver is also a human that needs care. That's right. You know, her That's general right. physician's office treated me like I was the freaking Uber driver. Right. And apparently, and then, you know, three plus years later, I'm still pissed off about it. Two plus years later. <laughs> we'll talk later. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's one of the things I hear the most is that the primary caregiver, whether it's the adult child or the spouse, uh, will feel dismissed. They are telling the doctors information that they need to know, and then they're going to try to validate it with a person who has dementia, right? So I think, we're, you know, it's an education and process with everybody involved, but we do need to listen more to the caregivers because you guys are in the throes of it, you know? And, and before we finish, there is one more thing I do want to say about triggers and all of this. And that is when there's an abrupt change, like abrupt, sometimes there could be a medical situation. Again, this is where we're documenting. I always tell people there's three times you want to document and there's a change in mood change in behavior and a change in medication. So sometimes if it's so abrupt, so out of the ordinary, we do want to check for maybe some treatable things going on, a UTI, urinary tract infection, dehydration, uh, side effects of medication, thyroid. If your loved one has thyroid, could it be off? 
So there is value in, in documenting or writing down. You don't have to, I don't want, you don't have to keep a journal. If you're not keeping a journal, you guys are stressed out, but there are times you want to keep specific information because if it is, like I say, a drastic, drastic change, dementia is progressive over time. An abrupt, drastic change is maybe an opportunity to say, hmm, maybe we have something medically or something treatable. Maybe, you know, toileting. A lot of times they can't communicate that they've soiled in their pants and there's nothing more uncomfortable. Again, as the disease progresses, they may not realize that. But here again, I do want to give everybody a heads up that sometimes there might be something else going on that we may want to look further into. The one thing I also wish, and I was looking into it literally a month before she fell and broke her leg, is a service that would actually go to them. Mm Because to have to take her, you know, to the doctor and then over to the other building for, you know, an x-ray or for the, you know, and just... Just the constant bustling about, and I mean, it's just, I mean, it's exhausting for all of us. And yes. for them, they, you know, with, you know, their sensitivity to a lot of stimulus is just not great. And, oh, it was just like, really? You want me it's to drag her all over the place? My favorite thing was they wanted to do a, um ultrasound. And they said, well, can you have her drink at least 32 ounces of water? And I, that's exactly what I did. Totally laughed. Yeah. And you could, you could feel feel the WTF expression on the person's face. Like yeah. I didn't even need a zoom call. And I said, I will do the best I can. Yeah. Um, if she has to have that much water yeah. or this isn't going to work, I need to know now. Cause I'm not going to drive her 20 miles away for this. Yeah. Yeah. And I, cause I, you know, explained for like the third time she yeah. has advanced Alzheimer's. I can't reason with her. Yes. So literally from mom's place to the, you know, the hospital with the MR or the, not the MRI, the, um, ultrasound. I'm like, Oh, can you drink some of this water for me? The doctor wanted you to drink water. And she'd look at me like, Oh, but she'd yes. take a sip of water. So we managed to get enough in, Yes. you know, and then, Oh, of course, then they make you wait. And it's like, uh, you know, yep. she has to pee and they're like, well, she can just drink more. Water. I'm like, no. And then like, at this point, I'm like, I so just regret having to, having even bothered to attempt this, this, ultrasound because i'm like this is just stupid like i said no she cannot just go pee and then drink more water i'm like when i was pregnant with my daughter they're like you know drink here all this water and then wait for the doctor it's like no right i can drink a bunch of water and then need to pee in another 15 <laughs> minutes but right. that's me right and, you know so it's just like when somebody tells you I am bringing in my loved one and they have advanced Alzheimer's that should initiate in a whole other protocol. Yeah. Even to the point of, well, if she can't get that much water in her, this may not be a test that we can manage. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for letting me know on a Friday afternoon after the doctor has run me through circles. Yeah. 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 Good point. <laughs> I mean, really it, it is, it's so much work. Um, and now there's, there are mobile uh, x-ray units. There are mobile blood draws. Uh, you know, there are services now that pick people up in a wheelchair or transport services. But I, I think you hit the nail on the head is this is a lot of work for the caregiver. And we have to be much more sensitive and see how we can make this, especially in, in the medical care. How can we make this a little bit better for all parties involved? Right. Like you said, a different protocol would be quite helpful. And, and this is what happens too. At some point, you, the caregiver, has to make these major decisions. And at some point you say, you know what, is that test absolutely necessary? Because it is so much work that if it's, if it's not life-threatening life, and even then, as this disease progresses, you end up making life decisions for your loved one who can't make it. So, I think, you know, your idea of coming up with a different protocol is absolutely spot on because we have to make this easier for everybody involved. Well, yeah, don't frustrate the caregivers so that they come in and explode all over your office. I did that twice, yeah, which is yeah. not beneficial to anybody. And yeah. now this screaming and yelling person that you want to throw physically into the parking lot. Yeah. You know, they yeah. have a valid point, but they are not making it in a valid way. You know, well, just, it's like, 
come on, let's all let's work together, people. <laughs> yeah. And you know what people forget? And this is this is family members, too. You guys pick up the slack when it's all done. You guys are the ones dealing with the pieces after the fact. Right. And that's the same with family members. They come floating in and we had a nice visit and then they decompensate once the family member leaves. Do you know what I mean? I mean, the primary person is the one that gets the brunt of all of this. And um, and one other thing I'll add is you have to have a sense of humor, because if you don't have a sense of humor, really, you may just you you may just throw your heart, heart, hands up and just say, I, I'm done. I can't do this. Right. And many times you'll feel that way. but. Again, the primary person is the one that picks up the slack, is knows this disease better than anybody because you're with it all the time. Yep. Even with my mom and memory care, that was yep. the case. Yeah. Your I just, work I isn't had done. The buffer with them. Right. But right. I was still like I, I like to call it, I called myself the captain of mom's care team. There you it go. Still came down to me. It does. You know? It does. And your job isn't over. A lot of times people have this enormous guilt about putting that maybe be a topic for another time, the guilt of placing their loved one. Your job isn't over. We've extended the care. We've extended the compassion. You're still the, you're still the decision maker. You're still the one that is on 24 seven. We've just provided an extended care for them. So you bring up another great point. And I think this thought just popped in my head. I think when you're You're trying to run your own life. You're trying to make sure you care for them. And they're in a memory care community. I think it's really easy to be harder on yourself because you're like, well, I'm not there 24 seven and this, that, and the other thing. Cause you know, and I think you expect to, I feel like I expected too much of myself. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, two plus years later, I'm just having that realization. (laughs) (laughs) But that's true. I talk about the the caregivers' expectations of themselves exactly, and uh, you're not perfect, and you're not going to be perfect. And we do have to give you all breathing room because, again, this is a a very challenging, demanding disease to manage. Yep. Yeah. This has been fantastic. I know you have a client who needs your help, so I don't want to run over any longer than we we've had a great talk and. Um, I know people will appreciate this episode, even though it's a little bit long, but make sure you guys pick up Tammy's book. It is excellent. I've read parts of it. I'm going to finish it once I'm not reading <laughs> the two others for the other recording. <laughs> I could spend all week reading multiple Alzheimer's books. So sometimes I have to go to a murder mystery just to lighten the load. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Jennifer, thanks a million for having me again. It's always a pleasure to see you and um, keep in touch, okay? I will for sure. And maybe I'll head to San Jose sooner or later. That would be great. (laughs) Absolutely. Or if I come up Auburn, I'll come your way. It's beautiful up here. We haven't had much spring or summer yet, but I'm waiting. Well, it's supposed to hit tomorrow, so I should not say anything. (laughs) I was going to say there's a heat wave coming. Yeah, it was 77 yesterday. It's supposed to be 87 today and 97 tomorrow. So 20 degree drop or increase in 48 hours. Yeah, Isn't I love that. Crazy? Isn't yeah, that crazy? Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. Totally but crazy. Yeah. I like it warm thankfully, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How often do you do are we well, you'll you'll edit all of this out, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, how often do you do the Peloton? Every day. Really? Mm-hmm. And w- do we do different programs? Yep. And how long are you usually on that bike? 45 minutes. Good for you. I try to do 45 minutes to an hour every day. Okay. Because of the hubbies not being able to walk the DOGs, one of which is in the room. Yeah. Um, I have to leave a little energy for that in the evening. <laughs> yeah. And don't you have an incline, a steep incline or something? Yeah. Was it you that you were telling me that you have to walk up and down? Yep. Yeah. And the youngest one, the one that's laying on the floor in here, he's uh, he throws his front shoulders in and just goes. It's like, yeah. dude, can we... Can we have a stroll, please? No, yes. <laughs> no, we're gonna jog up, jog up the hill. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. yeah, he's helping keeping me in shape too. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Hey, thanks for thanks for reading my book. Thanks for having me again twice, and I, I hope we'll be able to do this again sometime down the road. Awesome. Well, yeah. Go go forth and help your client, and will hopefully this will help a lot of people on the other end. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Keep in Alrighty. touch. Good to see you. Thank you. you. Uh Bye-bye. 
Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.